Well, hello, good evening and welcome. I'm Rob Hayward and I have the privilege this evening of hosting a stellar panel for this evening's discussion. Arlene Isaacs-Lowe, Special Advisor at Moody's Corporation, Jonathan Mildenhall, CEO at 21st Century Brand, Harriet Green, Global Business Leader, Executive Chair and Director, and the former Chair and CEO of IBM in Asia Pacific, and Suki Sandu, the Founder and CEO of Involve. Before I ask my panelists to introduce themselves, perhaps some context on this evening's event and this evening's discussion. At Principia, we're a network of academics, consultants, practitioners who come together around a common mission of building more ethical organizations. And in that capacity, last year, we partnered with Involve and with others to conduct the Ethics Study, the most extensive research program to date on the role of ethics in global corporations. And we found two things. We found that business leaders are more committed than ever before to integrating ethics and values into the heart of their organizations, and that they increasingly see ethics as an important differentiator in determining long-term success. But also crucially, that they see significant gaps between aspiration and action. And nowhere is that gap more evident than on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. 94% of leaders in the ethics study told us that shaping an inclusive culture is essential to being an ethical organization. But just 45% have any sort of diversity and inclusion program, and just 38% have established formal diversity targets. So in that context, how do we build on the growing recognition of both the moral imperative and the business case for diversity and translate that into real action. This evening, I'll be asking our panelists for their experience driving the DEI agenda in their own organizations, as well as for their views on what will be required to get beyond what we might sometimes feel are excuses for inaction and really accelerate change. And through the course of the session, please post your questions in the Q&A box towards the foot of your screen, uh, and we'll make sure to, to make time for, for questions towards the end. But first, let me ask our panelists to introduce themselves. And as we get into it, perhaps to share something that we might not know about them. And perhaps Arlene, let me come first to you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Rob. And um, thank you, Suki, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, as Rob indicated, I'm Arlene Isaacs Lowe. My current title is Special Advisor for Moody's Corporation. I recently stepped down at, in my role as Global Head of Corporate Social Responsibility and President of the Moody's Foundation, but have enjoyed a 23 year career at Moody's where I, this is actually my ninth role. So I've had mm -hmm. doing a number of different things over a 23 year career. And um, I would say diversity and inclusion has always, in any role that I have had, been a passion and at the forefront of my thinking, um, both in the context of um, you, uh, rationalizing um, the importance of diversity and, and inclusion from a business imperative, but perhaps more recently, uh, thinking about how to integrate that into the culture and the fabric of the organization, particularly as we drive, we drove a re-engineered uh, corporate social responsibility strategy. Um, I thought I would, I, I was asked to share a fun fact <laughs> about me that not many people know. And um, I, one of the things that I think um, has been really uh, integral to the person I have become as an adult is that I went to a highly selective high school um, in New York City. It was a free education of what we refer to here as public, but um, it was the only the third year that they had started letting girls in. So I attended high school with 6,000 boys and 300 girls. And I that is the experience I had that made me really comfortable being in male dominated rooms and, and industries. Mm, beautiful. Wonderful, Arlene, thank you. Jonathan, let me come to you. 
Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Jonathan Mildenhall and I am co-founder and chair of a brand consultancy, 21st Century Brand. And we basically help companies, the rising stars of today, so that's the Pelotons, the Pinterest, uh, the Headspaces, really help them realize the full potential of being community-driven brands. And that means ethics are at the foundation. But we also work with Centurion companies like Walmart and Mars and help them reimagine um, their brands through modern technology and 21st century marketing practices. Again, ethics um, and fairness are at the heart of um, those strategic initiatives. Um, what many people might not know about me is that I recently, two years ago, I became a father uh, and I've got, I'm the proud father of a little white skinned boy and a little brown skinned girl. Why is that relevant? Nothing outrages me more than knowing that my little brown skin girl is going to have to work so much harder to stay at parity with her younger white skin brother. Uh, and I'm hoping that this generation of leaders today are going to transform their approach to building companies and managing the workforce so that when my two little kids get into the workforce, the color of her skin and the gender that she identifies with is actually not important at all um, to her ability to do the work that she wants to do. So we all have um, about 20 years ahead of us to get this right. Uh, and um, I hope you can uh, join me in holding us all accountable to doing just that. Wonderful, Jonathan. Thank you. And I think your story, as well as Arlene's, just gives that sense of these are not abstract content, concepts that we might sometimes knock around <laughs> in forums like this, but real things, real decisions that affect people's lives and, and prospects. And, and thank you for that. Harriet, let me come to you next. Thank you. Yes. Um, my background is uh, running businesses as a public company CEO, uh, always as an activist for uh, uh, diversity and inclusion. My pledge is over 35 years old. And as my first CEO role, I took a strategy to the city in 2006 called People, Planet and Profits. And everyone said they liked the third bit, but they weren't that struck <laughs> on the first two. So uh, I, I've run businesses uh, with amazing brands. I was privileged to uh, uh, work for IBM and, and run uh, their large Asia Pac uh, uh, business. And right now I'm the uh, uh, chair of the trustees of an impact startup called Mission Beyond, which is driving an extraordinary social mobility platform, helping young people uh, uh, to job. So the things, uh, little things about me that you might not know, I have lived and worked uh, on four different continents and uh, five different industries and sectors. When I was a little girl, what I most wanted to do was to run a post office. Uh, because in our little community in the middle of nowhere, the post office was the center of everything. And I don't think anyone except my mum knows this, but I do actually have a cup and loved more than anything tap dancing. So that art of performance uh, <laughs> and ensuring that us outsiders get to the center of what really needs to be done uh, continues to be core. So delighted to be with you tonight. Wonderful. Thank you, Harriet. And I think there's still time for the uh, the tap dancing postmaster. So maybe um, uh -huh. <laughs> the aspiration and the ambition going. Suki, <laughs> let me come to you. Hi, everyone. Um, well, first of all, I'm really honoured to be alongside these incredible role models. They know how much I really respect and admire everything they do for our communities. Um, so I'm the founder and CEO for Ordellis and Involve. Ordellis is an executive search firm that levels the playing field for diverse talent focusing on race, gender, and LGBT+. And we've been doing it for over 10 years and really proud of the change. We are, I suppose, actually changing the face of business, both sides of the pond in terms of leadership and boardrooms, which we're really proud of. And then Involve is an inclusion consulting firm where we support companies with diversity and inclusion. So through talent programs, role modeling, et cetera. Um, my fun fact, I feel it's not as interesting as everyone else's. Mine is, I was just going to tell you that I once starred in a music video. <laughs> oh, 
with for who? Uh, for who? Which one? Yeah. Which one? It's with uh, with Fergie. Oh, my, that's cool. That's so cool. I'm only in it for like ten seconds. But it doesn't matter. Like, you got in it. But all look at look at look at it afterwards. It's it's London Bridge, Fergie, and I have a shaved head, so I'm very different. I've got much shorter hair, and I'm one of the paparazzi. And I got to meet her. I was basically spotted in Shoreditch one day where this person came up and she goes, hey, hey, do you want to be in a music video? And I was like, what? Get away from me. He goes, no, it's for Fergie. And then I turned around and went, you don't make me. <laughs> <laughs> I got a hundred pounds for the day, took a day off. And I, yeah, I've been the only one, one day in my life where I've been a model straight dancer. So oh, look, know. look at that. You're the one who says, oh, it's not really as cool as Ollie, you lot. And then you end up, yeah, you know, slam dunk yeah. the pool. <laughs> so that's my fun fact. The I'm most perfect. impressive. It's one of the most impressive. And it says something worrying about my own cool credentials. But if someone had told me that Fergie was making a music video, I'd have wondered why the Duchess of York was having a, a late career change. Oh, bless so, uh, I'm not going to compete on that front. <laughs> so, we need to get you out of Edinburgh. I think so. So with those introductions, and, and thank you all for, for sharing that bit around kind of who you are, your perspective, and, and your own personal perspective on, on diversity as well, I should maybe kind of say I we talked before this session um, with the panelists about perhaps skipping the first 20 minutes of the discussion that concentrates on the fact that diversity issues are important, the fact that we there is a moral imperative, the fact that there is a business case, because I think to some extent we're preaching to the choir on that. And I think anyone for whom the penny hasn't yet dropped on that probably is not on this session and probably is not a kind of worthwhile audience for, for, for this panel. Um, and so what we talked about was really kind of skipping to the nub of the issues and around that piece between aspiration and action and, and achievement. And Ali, maybe I could come to you first because the, the ethics study, as I talked about at the beginning, showed a, a real clear commitment from business leaders to build more diverse, more inclusive organizations, but also showed that real significant gap when it comes to fulfilling those aspirations. But for you, what's standing in the way? So um, I think that is an excellent starting point, um, Rob, because as you said, you know, we are all sort of advocates and believers in the benefits of diversity and inclusion. I personally have been frustrated over a 30 plus year career in regards to the talk versus the walk. Um, I do think in the last 24 or so months that things feel different. And I, I do think it has been spurred by the, um, the, the impact of the pandemic laying to bear the disproportionate and, dis and, and disparities between um, ethnicities. In addition to the highlighting of the racial injustice um, that was brought to light uh, with the murder of George Floyd and all of the other instances we saw in, in 2020, 2019 and 2020. Um, I think the reason that we have not seen the change was, as I said before, there has been an articulation and co of commitments without real follow on action. Um, as someone who has followed the evolution of ESG and the importance of that in terms of stakeholder capitalism, um, transitioning from shareholder capitalism, um, what feels different today is that leaders and not only leaders, but brands are being held accountable for um, really taking action against the commitments that they have made. And so, um, you know, and people are watching. They're watching and they're measuring. I think that the um, aspect of disclosure and transparency um, has the potential to really um, change the face of the commitment we're, that we're seeing in companies, at least that is my hope. Um, and I also think because of uh, everything that has been highlighted and the uh, power of stakeholders 
particularly consumers and young people, um, companies are going to be held accountable for that. It's really interesting, Aline, when I hear you talk, because it is certainly from a US perspective, um, we've had this narrative mm -hmm. for decades, but the narrative has not been endorsed by organizations that make a difference, certainly in the um, business world, up until August of 19, when the Business Roundtable actually declared that US businesses shouldn't be held accountable to the just shareholders, they have to be held accountable for stakeholders, and that means community, supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. And so that is now a huge endorsement, you know, led by one of the world's most powerful bankers, a guy called Jamie Dimon. And, and so you've got this endorsement now, which allows leaders to have a much more rounded perspective on how they're gonna be measured. And then you had this flashpoint in culture um, uh, after the murder of George Floyd, which you know, gave rise to voices and CEOs had to step out of their offices and say, enough is enough. We support these communities. We're gonna hand money over to these organizations that can help us transform our workforces. And what's great is these organizations even though they might be political organizations or social organizations, are not afraid to hold the CEOs and the companies accountable if they don't see the results. So like you, I feel that we are now seeing a momentum because the issue is out of the closet. And as a gay man, I know once you come out of the closet, you can't go back into the closet. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this issue has been closeted in corporate offices for decades and now it's out. And we've got very, very powerful voices that will hold leaders and companies accountable uh, to make change. So, so like you, I feel incredibly optimistic that the next five years, because of work of, that we're all doing, but organizations like Suki as well, um, we're going to see the most radical transformation of the corporate workforce than we've ever seen. And I think it, to reinforce what what you've said there, Jonathan, and, and of course, Arlene. And so it needs to be because this vortex of change, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about the forces, Jonathan, that you and Arlene described. We're talking about a health pandemic and extraordinary technology change that all of the data released in the last couple of months shows that those that were underrepresented or disadvantaged before are even more so now. So I think that that optimism is important, the power of the brand, the commitment, the promise, the employees, and also those who buy and sell companies. But I think that for me, the two pieces that are extraordinarily important at this time, the catalysts are one, the leaders of units, organizations, businesses, countries, you name it, who really need to create the sort of psychological, physiological, and anatomical program that is, you know, driving innovation-led growth, and employees, the people that I mentor, that I coach, the employee value proposition that they're calling out for is richly diverse, deeply inclusive, to create solutions that will drive growth. And the reason that growth is so important is without growth, our economies that fund all of, of what we're talking about here corporately will falter. So I think that optimism is important, but it, it, it needs accelerants uh, because the, the divide and the gap that this vortex of change has created uh, uh, is is extraordinarily impactful on those that were less well served by us before, I think. Well, if I could just add also, um, I agree with everything the panelists have said, but when you, I think one of the, the main reasons that I think there's there's been diversity or DEI hasn't progressed as much is because I think a lot of the leaders in charge don't quite know where to start. DEI is even using the term DEI, 
So before you might have just said diversity 10 years ago, then people are saying diversity and inclusion. And now people are saying diversity, equity and inclusion. So even just the terminology itself, for people to understand what it means, because people many times get equity and equality confused and they're two very different things. And I think when you're in the world of DNI, yes, these all make sense to you. But if you talk about the average straight white guy that is the majority in the workforce, don't have a clue. They don't know what these terms mean. So I think, and we already know that most of the CEOs and chairmen in charge are largely supposedly straight, I would say, white men. Some of them are slightly dubious, <laughs> but you know, supposedly straight white men who, um, to be fair, as, as um, Jonathan said with BLM last year, they have nowhere to hide. Silence is complicit. Inaction is not an option. And actually I don't think it was the CEOs themselves being brought out and optimistic. It was their employees forcing them to. They had no choice. They had absolutely no choice. Like if you look at some of the companies last summer, like Nike, for instance, who were put through the coals because of having no African-American representation in their C-suite, when they represent so many African-American sports stars, it's unacceptable for a business of that size to not have that representation. So I think employee activism has a huge part to play in the change we've seen in the last year. But CEOs and chairs are realizing they can't sit there in silence anymore. They have to do something. But the issue is they don't know what they're supposed to do. They don't know how. So there's a spectrum of, of leaders where there are some on this side that are super progressive, really, really drive change, do one of things like Paul Pongman at Uni formerly Unilever, for instance. The other spectrum, you have these dinosaurs. It's the only way to describe them. The only way things are going to change is when they're extinct when they resign, when they roll off their tenure as CEO or chairman, they're never gonna do anything. I'm not gonna say who they are, but I know some of them. The majority are actually in the middle. They wanna do something, they just don't know how. And I think that's the, the biggest thing is the challenge is trying to fill that gap of the how and trying to give them the tools and data they need to really drive the change in their businesses. Suki, like, can yeah. I just say that the dinosaurs are not necessarily old. So my, is, my business serves, you know, companies that were birthed in the 21st century. Uh, and one of the things that we do to make sure that there is proper awareness at the C-suite is we do an exposure audit. What is an exposure audit? Just take me through your calendar and show me when you were exposed to women and people of color in all of your meetings. Because in Silicon Valley, getting exposed to women outrageously is still not obviously um, an event in a CEO's calendar. And getting exposed to people of color is even, even less of an event. So I, I, I am banging the drum when we do the exposure audit. The board, the C-suite, your executive team, the teams in the organization, and how much time do you spend out in the community so that you are really, really clear on who it is that you're serving. And you'd be so surprised at how um, uh, homogenous the people that surround, some of the people that are making these decisions, even though these people have made public declarations, but how homogenous um, uh, they, the, the people that they're exposed to can look very, very quickly. So, so dinosaurs, yes, but don't think of old. Also yeah. think of young, white tech founders and CEOs. Yeah. Um, uh, they're just not exposed in the way that they should be. Jonathan, so thank, I, thank you for that. Let me, let me come, Arlene, I think you wanted to, to come in on that. Yeah, so, so the other thing I, I do want to um, talk about is when, you, when I read through the ethics study, there was um, evidence of an overwhelming majority of leaders who had belief systems um, around ethics broadly, but certainly the diversity, equity, and inclusion. I, in my observation, and having gone, uh, been under the leadership of two CEOs that I genuinely believe personally were, were committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, I do think there is an aspect of the middle. And while there is tone from the top until you have accountability. And when I think about accountability, it, it, it's, it's one thing to sort of change the mindset and the culture of a company, but 
the other aspect of it is to really make sure that it has implications on people's money mm -hmm. and their career advancement. And to me, that's what will make the change. And to do that, um, I look forward to greater disclosure and transparency of companies, not only the, their employees, but also the business that they're doing and who they're doing that business with. Because until you have that coming there, I think there's always going to be the talk. Arlene, thank you. Harriet. I, I would just build on that, uh, on what Suki has said and Arlene has said, in that if you look at the companies who over a sustainable period of time uh, have created diversity, inclusion, not just in the hiring, but in the uh, um, uh, retention, in the progression, approaching this human issue in the same way you would a climate change issue, a new product issue, you know, a save the company an existential issue. But first of all, the mindset, the leaders, the permafrost in the middle, you know, those in the organization, a psychological mindset. Then you have a physiology, what are the processes, the nerve endings, the uh, incentives, the accountability, what is it we deliver by when, and how do we celebrate the success around that? Uh, and then the structure, when we got very close in uh, Asia Pac with IBM to half of the executives being female and having ethnicity that represented the countries they served, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, uh, Thailand, et cetera, then managing what 50-50 looks like uh, 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 in that environment. So I think Suki's point about people not understanding the terminology or, or not really knowing where to start, if you look at those companies who sustainably have done better than the others, they have an approach uh, a, a psychological approach, a set of processes, and a structure that supports ultimately what is the goal, which is real progression and retention. Anyone can have a blitz at hiring. Uh, 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 not everyone does, sadly, but the goal is, is that it becomes the culture of the organization where people look in and they see themselves. Good. Harriet, thank you. And I'm really interested in the point that you raised earlier around the the catalysts, the kind of accelerants that we can bring to, to this conversation. And, and Suki, maybe I could ask you, you talked about the, the leaders at either end, people who really get it, people who never will, and then a majority of leaders kind of in the middle there wondering what to do and perhaps feeling uncertain. To what extent do you think accelerating progress is dependent on those leaders perhaps individually being more courageous, taking risks? And to what extent do you see progress really depending on other actors around business, whether that's government, investors, starting to, to move the system as well? So I, think, I think when you're trying to drive um, diversity and inclusion or DEI, you kind of do need to be brave because not everything is going to work first time and you are going to make mistakes along the way. So I think if you think about the senior leaders, even trying to, to deal with the conversations around race, that nervousness about saying the wrong thing is stopping them from saying anything at all. Mm -hmm. So being, being able to accept that you're going to stumble and make mistakes, I think is the first acceptance that you need to come to to be able to start having the conversation. But then what that requires from the minorities or diverse people within the organization is for them to be more empathetic to the leaders that are trying rather than immediately jumping to calling it racism or homophobia or sexism because they may say the wrong things in very different contexts. So I think you definitely need the leaders, as everyone said, people keep talking about accountability and accountability is really important. And one way of holding accountability is being very public and explicit, for instance, on setting diversity targets communicating them externally, giving them a deadline and reporting on progress. Yeah. Because what it's effectively doing is you're committing to something externally that you can't really turn your back on. 
So what are you, how are you gonna, how are you going to achieve them? What's your plan? So things even like gender pay gap reporting, where it's looking at um, the average pay of, of, of people within the organization and the gender pay gap, the pay gap exists because there aren't enough women in high paid roles in businesses. This isn't about gender, gender equal pay. And so what it did was it gave a measure for the businesses holding a mirror up to the organization for them to create interventions to try and close that gap. So I know in the UK, they're thinking of making ethnicity pay gap reporting um, uh, mandatory, which I hope comes in because there are companies that are already voluntarily reporting it. So trying to take action on ethnicity, um, but it, it does act as a tool for them to make change in their business and actually drive it. But I think the middle managers are also just as important as Ali mentioned, but everything is getting pushed out to them. <laughs> there's more and more pressure on them because obviously the leaders at the top obviously delegate and as they get done, there's more pressure on the middle managers who are executing, doing the work and their workloads are increasing. That diversity and inclusion does become a discretionary effort because they're also trying to deliver their day job. So mm -hmm. there needs to, we need to remember that DEI is everyone's responsibility. It's not just one person. Everyone is responsible for culture. Everyone is responsible for ethics. Everyone is responsible for behaviors. But I think the leaders at the top are the ones that role model the behaviors that you want the people to follow. Yeah, that, that role modeling point, Suki, I think is so fundamental. You know, how you, uh, if you've had challenges as I have in the past around age diversity, you know, setting up shadow boards, putting mutual mentoring between, you know, a lifer in a company and the young people, you know, being openly and actively supportive of people because of their age and their sex and their color, their creed, their physical and their cognitive uh, abilities, those actions, those words, that encouragement. And even when you stumble, uh, uh, I, I was interviewing the head of DNI for IBM a couple of weeks ago, and uh, 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 she is non-binary. And we were preparing, and I I got a bit of in a pickle around my pronouns. And she just said, "Harriet, you know, I know where your heart is. We'll keep working at this." And it's just people know if you care and you love that getting sometimes the wrong word or or getting your pronouns in a pickle because you've known. Uh, them in a different uh, uh, agenda, it doesn't matter. What matters is the respect for human beings and doing the right thing ethically and practically when people are and aren't looking. And so I think stumbling's fine if, you, if your heart is there, but the tiny things uh, uh, that leaders do permeate. It is everyone's responsibility, but permeate through an organization at like a wildfire. Absolutely. Uh, the, the point around um, what, what Harriet said about being okay with stumbling um, and, and also, it, you know, being okay with the criticism that one could get from um, you know others that don't think like that CEO does or aren't aspiring to that culture, but as important is giving grace to those leaders who are making an effort. Um, you know, post the the um, the the highlighting of the racial injustices in the United States, we had a series of um, what we referred to as brave conversations. And it was interesting, um, the folks in the US, um, you know, immediately sort of took advantage of those opportunities. And actually having spent some time in, in Europe, um, I had to sort of um, ensure that our folks in the European offices that were um, ethnically diverse participated in those conversations because they weren't necessarily um, acclimating to giving a voice on some of the issues they were experiencing. And it was very enlightening for our senior leadership because initially when we came out as, with a statement, they actually said, well, we don't have a problem in Europe. And I said, but you do, yeah. you do, they're just not being vocal about it. Yeah. And so it's been a real learning 
for um, the entire company um, to have those conversations. Yeah. Jonathan, I'd be really interested in, in your view, actually, on that Europe and US dynamic as a, as a Brit now based on the West Coast. I'm interested in how you've seen kind of differences in, in the business culture there and whether you see differences in how leaders are, are approaching some of these issues. It is interesting because in 2000, I'm aging myself now, but in 2000, I was given the role of chair of the IPA, um, uh, of which is the body of advertising agencies um, in the UK to change the portraiture of black and brown faces in British advertising and change the executive makeup of black and brown faces inside the agencies themselves. Within two years, we went from less than 1% of all the faces you saw in British advertising uh, of being a, of ethnic minority origin to over 14% because we took the issue out of the closet and creative people were like, great, I can just cast a more authentic, more diverse range of people. No problem at all. 20 years later, the needle hasn't shifted on the bodies inside the advertising agencies. Mm. So the expression of great British advertising has changed, but the makeup of the professionals who are producing their advertising has still not changed. So I get very, very jaded and very, very frustrated because sometimes certain things are easy to do and you can shift the needle within, 12, within 24 months. It was fantastic. It was a real achievement. And then I come to the US and the US is so big that segregation can truly, by choice, can truly exist. And so, and, and I, I struggled when I became, you know, head of marketing at Coca-Cola, I struggled with the fact that I needed a Hispanic marketing agency and an African-American marketing agency and a main, because in the UK, the, the markets are not big enough and my creative and strategic people need to understand how to, make sure that everybody is recognized in the plans. Sure, you might buy specific media, but do I have very, very discreet brands? And so, you know, the, the thing that I would, would say to characterize, the UK is still much more of a smaller culture, bleeding into culture, melting pot than the US. And the US is so massive that segregation can truly exist. And that what seems to have happened in the 13 years that I've been here is, you know, it's it pulling apart even more so. And so the challenge of getting, you know, brands and company brands and culture right in the U.S. feels that much more enormous than um, uh, in, in the U.K. But that said, when U.S. companies change, then people all around the world respect them. So Coca-Cola company changed in Atlanta. Every single Coke office all around the world changed pretty quickly. And every single Coke office then inspired other local businesses all around the world to change. So when the US gets it right, it can create this incredible kind of viral effect around the world. But the challenge is the US doesn't get it right um, anywhere near as much of, as it should. Jonathan, thank you. One thing I'd love to pick up on is, and Harriet, perhaps I can come to you, is I think sometimes all of us fall into a trap of talking about DEI as a single issue. Um, and we refer to DEI over here, and it's a single block. And I'd love to get your thoughts, perhaps, on what are some of the less appreciated aspects of, of DEI that you think are really going to be important to, to making progress on, on these issues? Yeah, um, I, and I often use the phrase to respond to this, Rob, that, you know, around, for me, teams that where people, because of their uniqueness, their age, I think many corporations have huge uh, age diversity, many countries, you know, uh, in the next three years, half of the population of the largest country in the world, India, will be under 30 and that youth is not represented by anyone under 30 in who they voted in the largest democracy. So uh, uh, sex, gender, we've talked about, uh, the facts already given that we have not made enough progress there. Um, uh, uh, color and, and, and creed, obviously, 
But for me, there are two that um, are, are really important that I've spent a lot of time working on. One is around cognitive diversity, mm. how particularly uh, with teams as you're looking for innovation led uh, uh, growth, how people with different uh, brain sets, different mindsets, how people come together, as Matthew Syed often says, you know, travel on the wheel and you get an amazing new industry uh, uh, of luggage that you can pull. But also physical ability. You know, 62% of people who've died of COVID uh, uh, in the data received globally uh, uh, were disabled. And so I think this issue that it, it, it's back to, you know, let, let's not get hung up on, you know, how do we specifically treat, you know, young women? How do we specifically uh, treat uh, 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 people uh, uh, around their sexuality? It, it is that each individual is unique and that, you know, in, in what we're doing at Mission Beyond and the startup there is around social mobility ensuring that young people be, with all of these you know attributes sometimes without many of the skills are, are required feel that the world is actually talking to them so i think you know for me diversity and inclusion is at that human core that says you know rob because of everything you are you know, you are special, you're unique, and you should get on. Uh, and I think it's, it's a rich repertoire of, of belief in other people because of who they are. Uh, and, and it's inevitable that we focus on, you know, areas where we've made so little progress. I was reading as I marched through Oxford the other day, the suffragette uh, mural on the wall about gaining us the vote and how little has been achieved beyond there. But you are quite right. There is a huge array of uniqueness about us that the ultimate cultural respect is that because of those, you will get on. Right, thank you. Suki, I'm interested in, in your view of the companies you work with. What are you seeing as some of the kind of the issues that are growing in importance under the kind of DEI banner? Yeah, the, the biggest thing for me, I have to say in the last year with BLM and the protest for last year, particularly UK and US, I've never seen such a focus on businesses trying to drive representation of racially diverse communities, particularly the black community. And I've never seen them wanting to invest in the development of those communities in their business, as well as trying to educate the non black or because because remember with with black lives matter me as a brown person i also had a lot of learning from the protests from the experiences of black people both in society and in the workplace and it was eye-opening for me and thinking well what more do i need to do as an ally to be better for the black community so there was learning from all sides but when you have like ceos like there's one client we're doing a cfo search for a tech company for instance and the ceo very explicitly said i want a black person for that seat now, I've been doing this for 18 years and I've never had a CEO explicitly say that. Usually they'd be saying, right, we really need to hire women. Gender was the big focus 10 years ago. It's why I said at Dallas was to get people, get the chairman and CEOs to realize diversity is more than gender, like trying to get them to think more broadly. So just seeing that, that as a key aspect of their, their progression is really important, but also it, they've had the pandemic to deal with. So remote working, which has been a huge people issue, then the pandemic of racism with BLM. And then in between that, we've had loads of other issues with climate change. We've had stop Asian hate. So another community that's suffering um, kind of persecution and prejudice, where again, all these different demographics needing the support reminds companies that they need to always be intersectional in their approach when it comes to diversity. And intersectional, I mean working across all communities, because as Harriet mentioned, the disability community has been massively impacted by COVID, for instance. So, and, but there's also opportunities created from the pandemic with remote working, meaning that there are hopefully more opportunities for disabled communities to work, because particularly ones with physical disabilities not having to travel into the workplace. 
But I think for me, the last year, for me, race has been front and center for most of the companies we're working with. And quite rightly so, if I'm honest, it was about time. Suki, thank you. A question I'd like to ask, I think all four of you, before we go to some of the, the questions from, from the audience, is we can talk a lot in, in forums like this around what should be done over there by other companies, other leaders, governments, investors. But actually, this is something that, you know, we all lead on in, in our own organizations. And there are issues that we all struggle to make as much progress as, as we'd like to. And in the spirit of that kind of translation from aspiration to action and achievement, I'd love to get the sense from the four of you as people who are clearly deeply passionate, deeply committed to these issues, perhaps one thing that actually you're struggling with right now. What's something where actually in your own organizations, organizations that you work with, you've not made the progress that you'd like to. Uh, and actually you'd re perhaps you're thinking, we need to think differently about that. Yeah. And maybe, I Harriet, let me come to you. Yeah, I, I've really been, I think it's a great question. And I, you know, as someone who sat on global boards and, you know, being a public company CEO, I've always resisted quotas uh, across the age, sex, color, creed, you know, physical ability, uh, cognitive, because I felt as a woman on a board, it was hard enough making the first input and being recognized for my value without thinking, yeah, well, you know, she's the quota girl. Um, but if I read the World Economic Forum report, Rob, uh, in uh, March of this year, and the fact that, you know, if we just take women as an example, the section on disabled, the section on people of color, that it, 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 and Yesterday, the social mobility report, if you really want to see uh, how we're disadvantaging youth in this country. But in the case of women that we're set back really three generations uh, uh, by what has transpired. So I've really been wondering if, as the, the, the French have and the Germans, whether uh, we need uh, to be thinking about uh, quota systems that, of course, have unintended consequences. We saw that across Nordic. But when the number of people recycled into the statistics that are given uh, from the headhunters, etc., obviously not Suki, but, uh, you know, it's the same people rotating, you know, that are an acceptable face. I've really started to dive into the new French system, the German system, uh, follow some of what is happening in the US? And do we need a period of time where just as we did, you know, after the revolution in South Africa, and we quoted, you know, the whole uh, uh, industrial construct to ensure that people of color came through, I'm beginning to think that is something that, you know, I need to think about. So I'm worried about that, Rob. Good. Harriet, thank you. Arlene. Um, so, I, I, you know, the thing that I have um, sort of always struggled with, and um, I am aspirational that this will change going forward, simply because of demographics, um, and it's something that we cannot hide from any longer, was the transition from people talking about diversity as the right thing to do, to really embracing it as a, an inherent and um, essential part of business strategy. So for instance, for us, we've had a lot of focus internally on um, our diversity inclusion strategy um, as it relates to our workforce, how we're promoting women, how we're promoting different ethnicities, um, you know, importantly, and some of the, the significant challenges we've had was around recruiting, but even more challenging has been retention. But I do think, you know, I, I'm very focused on authenticity. And so I, I have been, um, sort of driving thought leadership on the aspect of 
um, you know, what does this mean for the business and this whole aspect of long-term sustainability of, of an organization? And, um, you know, as, as global head of corporate social responsibility, I remember coming to the leadership team and the board about the focus areas that we should um, be really contemplating and um, talked about sort of economic empowerment for small and growing businesses that are owned by women and, and people from underserved communities around the world. And I said, I, I talked about this being really a commercial action because ultimately <laughs> we can't change um, how the demographics will evolve. And so don't you want to be in a position where you have supported these businesses at their, when they were nascent to gain brand loyalty when they become large and important um, and are essential to be part of your customer base. Because when I initially talked about it, you know, it was a conversation around, well, that's not our customer base. You know, we don't really service small businesses. But the one thing I kept saying was, well, think about if 50 years ago, we supported Facebook or Google. Do you, can you imagine the brand loyalty that we'd have today? And so getting people to think about it sort of more broadly than it's the right thing to do, or you know, um, even from solely a talent perspective, to this is how the world will be evolved because the will evolve because the reality is in time there'll be more brown and black people than white people. And where do you want to play out when that happens? Wonderful. Harleen, thank you. Suki, let me come to you. Um, I would say that one of the, the biggest challenges of priority, I think, not just for my business, but, but for most businesses, is around with the remote working, how trying to keep your employees engaged when you're all working remotely is quite challenging and quite tough. Trying to then also be inclusive while people are working remotely is like another layer of complexity to that. So I think for me, I'm constantly trying to learn from my own team, like what do they need to be supported in a remote setting? Because I find it quite tough not being around my, my employees, but I also love being in Bournemouth by the sea. I don't wanna be in the city in London every day, so I'm quite enjoying it, but we're still trying to figure out how that works. And as Ali mentioned, retention is a real issue because with remote working, you don't even have to leave your house anymore to find a new job at any level, be it entry, middle manager or exec or board, it's all remote. So companies have to work twice as hard, big or small, to try and retain their talent. So I think that's, for me, it's that culture engagement from a remote perspective is a huge priority. Fantastic, Suki, thank you. Jonathan. I, I, I am completely with Suki. You know, I, I sit on a board um, called College Track that helps young, men and women from disadvantaged, underserved um, uh, communities get into and graduate from college. And doing that work is some of the most rewarding work that I've ever done. Um, and I'm very, very proud that 21st Century Brand was committed to an internship program and would advise our clients also to be committed to an internship program to give these young students uh, work experiences that truly can be transformational. Uh, some of these young men and women have never even been into an office before. And so when we were all in offices, just to give proper work experience so that they could understand even what a coffee maker does in an office to some of these young disadvantaged kids, they've never had that. Uh, and you know, remote working has made the experience and the opportunities that we could give um, so much less tangible for um, uh, these young students. And I'm genuinely concerned that right now we've got this huge cultural opportunity where internship programs um, uh, could create the right kind of pathways, but I'm yet to see an internship program be successful 
in terms of engagement and development, inspiration and permanent jobs, if it's been all done remote. Unless, of course, it's engineering, that is a slightly different discipline, but uh, remote working in terms of being an on-ramp for young kids to get into uh, the workforce is a real challenge, really, really challenging. Fantastic, Jonathan, I love that, and it's a great challenge and perhaps a great opportunity for someone who can get it right. And that's yeah. a, a whole new, a whole new yeah. talent pool, which is, is really untapped. Yeah. I want to come to a couple of questions from the audience and perhaps with the, an eye on the clock, I'll take kind of fastest hand first for, for whoever wants to, to come in on these. I mean, one question is, what's the role of business in, in changing public opinion? We talk about business as if it responds to the needs of their customers and responds to the, the whim of the public. But what's the business's role in the public sphere in actually changing minds and, and shaping the mindsets of, of, of people and communities? Oh, well, I think uh, it's... Go. Sorry, Jonathan, yeah. go ahead. Go. No, you go, please. I, I was, I'll be very quick. I think it's huge. It's back to Suki's boldness, you know, CEOs of public companies, people in government, startups, you know, wonderful businesses that we have around this table, being voices uh, of reason and wisdom and activism and passion and positivity has to be a part of the role. And I, I would underscore that, you know, businesses have tremendous resources and one of the pools of resources is marketing and marketing can push forward cultural mores and social norms quicker than any other tool. And so whether it's the portraiture of who shows up in marketing or where marketing shows up in local communities and starts acting in service of the local communities, marketing can be a huge, huge driver of significant cultural change. Uh, and as a marketer, I would say that, but if there's any marketers listening to this, it's like really, really think, are you investing your marketing dollars in a way that is shifting society forward in the right ways? And if you're not, you need to go to 21st century brand. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, man. I love you, man. I love you, man. <laughs> the, the only thing I would also add on is um, I think it's the responsibility of business to demonstrate to the public that um, acting in a moral way is not a sacrifice to the return and to returns or profitability. Fantastic. What, one, one thing I would add is also that this isn't a time for businesses to sit on the fence. Uh, Learn that in the last year, like whether you voted for Trump, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, like this is not a time to sit on the fence. And I think we've seen companies both sides, like whether you're more liberal or whether you're more conservative, where I remember there was a tech company, I forget the name of it, that very explicitly came out a few months after Black Lives Matter saying that politics needs to stay out of the workplace and we don't want any of that in our business. And then within the next week, I think about a third of their workforce resigned. Right. But those co-founders made a decision that that is what they stand for and they don't want it in their business. So they, they stood by their convictions. Now there's two arguments about whether they were right or not, but at least they stood by what they believed. On the other hand, there were other companies where BLM was such a big focus in their business, making public statements, saying they're going to have lots of money to black organizations. But what we found a year later is that a tiny percentage of that money has actually been given to those organizations so far. That it comes back to that accountability. Who's holding them accountable to make sure they give the cash? Yeah. Oh, powerful. Suki, okay. all of you, thank you. And I think that that perhaps is a great note to finish on. And if there's one theme that I think seems to have animated our discussion throughout is that notion of it's no time to sit on the fence and neither is it the time to sit with positive but somewhat woolly aspirations and supportiveness to do better but actually it's the time for courage it's the time to step forward and in, in the point that many of you made it's the time to actually feel comfortable with discomfort feel comfortable getting things wrong feel comfortable taking risks uh, and i think that is a, a great kind of point to uh, to to end on um can i, I also think, say rob go on, go on. because you are the white guy uh, in this group <laughs> uh, and you know but it's really really important you have convened a conversation and sometimes it's been uncomfortable but the way that you have convened the conversation and lent into it um uh is is uh, is really admirable and um if anybody is thinking oh i'm not sure that i could kind of lean in and host this kind of conversation because 
I'm not a minority, I'm not a woman, then uh, just look at the way that Rob handled it because it was pretty Absolutely. impressive. That's exactly. a great point, Jonathan. Fabulous, wonderful. Jonathan, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Arlene, Jonathan, Harriet, Suki, yeah. thank, thank you so you much. Guys. Thank you all for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having us. And have a great what evening. Great, great panelists Bye. and participants. Bye, everyone. Thank you all.